from there. Uh, maybe do a quick visit to Palestine. We had a uh, very, very moving talk from Jimmy Carter yesterday. How many of you were at that talk? Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah. It was probably a little more nostalgic for me than it was for you because, as he pointed out, you weren't born when he was president, but I was walking the streets of Tomales, California, stomping votes uh, for him. Um, so it was really very emotional for me when he when he started speaking, and I remembered his voice and how you know we the things that we complained about then were absolutely absurd compared to the things we've got going for us now, but. We had a longish uh, meeting with him after the talk, about 25 of us, thanks to the generosity of Rabbi Lerner. And he made it even more poignant than he had during the big talk that while the substantial majority of people in the United States and Israel, not to mention Europe and the rest of the world, want a peace agreement in Israel-Palestine, something happens uh, to make it not only difficult but impossible to get. And I, I thought it might be good for us to think about that a little bit because we've been talking all along about how awkward it is to work with established structures. And here you are. I once went one uh, summer, I guess, to Washington, D.C. with the Tikkun uh, community to talk to Congress people. Every congressperson that I went to see, and I heard the same report from most of them, they were so glad to see us. They said, we see nothing but APAC, APAC, <coughs> APAC. This is the pro, quote, pro-Israel, uh, pro-aggression lobby. And uh, we, we agree with you, and we would love to give you what you want, but we would not be reelected. So there's a strange thing that happens where the majority of people, as people, want one thing, which is a reasonable, reasonably just solution. I mean, we're not talking a revolution here or a world of peace or anything like that, but just you know, a reasonable adjustment. And yet between the will of the people and the decision by the people, something happens to turn everything drastically to the right. Yeah, to the right. So I was struck uh, having that in the back of my mind when I read the latest newsletter from CPAS, this is an organization that we've mentioned before, stands for Servicio Paz y Justicia, Peace and Justice Service, and they operate throughout uh, Latin America, but the particular focus is in Mexico, and within Mexico they're particularly focused on the movement in Chiapas, and we haven't talked about that movement very much. but. I'm back one topic now. I'm, I'm out of the spiritual dimension of the cultural revolution, and we're back to the topic we were talking about, the struggle against globalism. So the struggle against globalism is acute in these villages uh, and small communities in Mexico where, I mean, if you think about this situation that we've created here, it's pretty appalling. We have ruined their economic hopes, so they're now impoverished and in many cases pushed from poverty to destitution. And then when they try to get out, we build this huge fence and uh, we have people with machine guns to, to keep them out. So it, it's, you know, this is probably an exaggeration and probably I'm going to be sorry that I said this in front of the whole wide world web, but it's almost like a kind of economic genocide that's going on. Where we impoverish people and then don't let them escape from the poverty that we've created for them. So the uh, EZLN, the Zapatista Liberation uh, Army, has uh, taken matters into their own hands. And one of the things that, okay, I, I should stop myself before I go too far and say, I am not saying that the Zapatistas are, are a nonviolent movement, purely and simple. It's not like that. Um, <coughs> they are, I would say, they are nonviolent wannabes. We, I think I told you that we had a message from Subcomandante Marcos. I that, that, that you'd write a, a film or a novel about that, a message from the Subcomandante, you know, <laughs> this mask. And, and uh, we were meeting uh, at, at a Quaker meeting place south of here, Ben Lomond, about nonviolence and uh, it, TPNI, though we didn't call it that then. And he sent a message by one of his people saying 
yes, we are doing this militarily, but if you show us a different way, we will take it. So that, that to me was uh, underscoring the importance of nonviolence education. And, uh, and again, to say that a, this is not a nonviolent movement yet, it's very complicated. There are many actors, some of them covert. But the point for right now is that what they have stimulated is different kinds and formats of organization. So for example, they had a meeting in a, t in a region called Oventique, which is kind of a headquarters for them. And at the beginning of the struggle, they actually took over this region. So it is actually something that would not be tolerated in the United States. There's a region which, in which federal government does not, uh, I its writ does not run. Federal, the, they can't intervene there to a very large extent. You try that here, the results would be very serious. You tried to get a little park in Berkeley which would not belong to the federal authorities and people died over that struggle. Now there is one little circle six inches in diameter in the middle of Sproul Plaza which doesn't belong to anybody, but uh, I would be tempted to call that symbolic. Anyway, they have an, an area in which they're able to really kind of recreate governmental authority on their own. And there was a meeting in December to January called the Encounter of the Zapatista People with the Peoples of the World. I'll, I'll have this here if you want to look at it. Uh, more than 2,000 people from 47 countries took part. 3,000 Zapatistas in addition from support bases. 200 members of 40, 40 autonomous town councils, that's one type, autonomous town councils, representatives of five good government committees, uh, several members of the general command of the clandestine revolutionary indigenous committee, uh, with that must be a nice uh, acronym, um, and they have organizations also from caracoles, caracoles is a, is a snail, right? So I think the idea here is that it's not hierarchical, but uh, sort of centrifugal organization of that kind. So amazingly enough, uh, and I don't think we're, yeah, there are different caracoles that have names like La Realidad and so forth, Roberto Barrios. In this way, this is a statement from one of the snails. Uh, in this way, the other government was initiated. The, now, what, what are we going to call this? What's our technical term for this? Is it the, the parallel institution. Yes, I, that one, one, two, three. Parallel institutions. Very good. <laughs> yeah. And remember, this is the most important type of parallel institution and the most, uh, it's, it's the most dangerous. Carry on. Paolo? Well, uh, I it's uh, like this. It's not a hierarchy. It's a central kind of organization. Do you ah, Michelangelo. Yeah. The slowness of the snail yeah. could be, not the bad taste. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, I don't myself. No, come on up, Michael. I don't myself know exactly how it works. But the point that I want to make is that. Uh, these are people who have invented alternate – we're talking about Chiapas at the moment. People who've invented alternate, uh, alternative governmental forms. And I just will leave this here, and I'll leave it at that. And I recognize that we've had no time for review today, and I haven't given you a passage for analysis. So let's do that pretty intensely on Tuesday. I'll mail you out a couple of passages, or at least one. And look over the ID forms, uh, ID terms, especially the ones that we haven't actually covered yet. And uh, just, you know, go through the whole semester. Insurrectionary movements, the reform movements, the anti-globalism movements, and now finally the spiritual revolution. <laughs> it's represented here. Um, and 
that, that'll be a big chance for you to have questions. I will try to do something which, as I was telling people this morning, is very unnatural for me, which is not talk. <laughs> and just, just be here to answer your questions. All right. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rabbi Lerner, who is uh, going to talk to us about spirituality and social change, and what, in particular, the network of spiritual progressives uh, is doing about it. Um, Rabbi Lerner was at one time called the, by J. Edgar Hoover, I think, the most dangerous man in America, and I'm very, very proud of that designation. Actually, I think Hoover was the most dangerous man <laughs> in America, but uh, you've got to choose your dangers in this world. <coughs> and uh, he has started a network and a community, and as you probably, most of you know, a uh, magazine called Tikkun, which was necessary to form when the premier Jewish uh, journal took a turn to the right and became a commentary. <laughs> So he said, the rest is commentary, this is reality. And uh, two years ago in the summer, uh, Michael and I put on a conference, he did all the work, uh, called the Spiritual Activism Conference, which was a fantastic success. We had about 1,400 people. And out of that, we're trying to develop a network of spiritual progressives balancing the need for some kind of organization with the need to escape hierarchical and uh, organization. So I think that having been said, Michael, more could be said about you, but I think we want to hear it from you. You gonna sit there? Uh, I might. Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll try to stand. Is you that try better? Stand, I'll try to sit. Uh, ha have any of you seen Tikkun Magazine? Anybody ever here seen it? Okay, not many, so I'm gonna ask, do you wanna pass, pass it around? Um, wanna Pass it around and, oh, yes. And this is an ad that, um, well, actually it has two sides. One side is um, an invitation for people to become interns with us. Tikkun is located in Berkeley, um, and the Network of Spiritual Progressives is located in Berkeley. And so we have summer internships, and we have internships for um, uh, September to uh, June of next year. So um, that's one side of that thing. But we don't have enough for each of you to keep it, but look at it. Read, you can read through the, the ad. The second side is an ad that we're about to place in the New York Times um, that uh, in a way is a manifestation of the spiritual politics that we've been developing. What's this for? What's oh. Okay. Um, okay. Well, no, it, it's an interfaith organization, and um, it's co-chaired by myself and uh, Cornell West, who is an African American, um, a social change activist and professor of African American studies at Princeton and by Sister Joan Chittister, who is a Benedictine sister and probably the most outspoken uh, feminist in the Catholic world. Um, so it's definitely not just for Jews. It's an interfaith organization. And the network of spiritual progressives is for, not just for people who are into a religion but also or into God, but into for anybody who has a spiritual consciousness. So that doesn't require that you believe in God or that you're part of a religion um, if you consider yourself in some way spiritual. Uh, I think I'll start by saying how, um, how we arrived at building a network of spiritual progressives this way. Um, I, was a, I was a social change activist here in Berkeley um, and was on the uh, <coughs> on the uh, executive committee of the free speech movement. It was uh, interesting to hear last night uh, the, the chancellor saying, well, we've always been for free speech here. This is our tradition. And we had to force it down their throats and at the cost of many of us being arrested and so forth. And then, <laughs> whatever. I don't, yeah, I won't go, get it, go there. But I was also president of Berkeley Students for Democratic Society, which was... Uh, 
um, an activist anti-war organization in the 60s. I was uh, in the, the heat of that. I was uh, in, uh, involved and then went to Seattle as a professor of philosophy. I got a PhD in philosophy here from Berkeley. And, um, uh, and there is where J. Edgar Hoover came into the scene. I, was, um, I led some uh, organized demonstrations that uh, were at the time the biggest thing that Seattle had ever seen and was eventually arrested. Um, indicted with seven others as part of the Seattle Eight Conspiracy, they called it, and, um, and sent to federal penitentiary um, for contempt of court, for which I have to admit that I was guilty. Um, I did have a lot of contempt for the way the judicial system was working at the time. Um, and um, afterwards, I watched the movement itself um, destroy itself in a whole variety of self-destructive ways. I can talk about that more if, if you want, want to hear about it. But um, I decided that understanding ideas was not enough. I, I had, at the time, I thought, and still in retrospect think, a lot of good ideas. But the ideas were not sufficient to understand what was going on because um, uh, I had all these good ideas, and we in the movement had all these good ideas. Why weren't people getting it? Why weren't people listening? And why were people even in the movement acting in such self-destructive ways? So I went back to graduate school and got a second PhD, this time in clinical psychology, to try to understand the psychological dynamics that were leading, on the one hand, leading people inside the movement to act self-destructively towards each other. Um, and on the other hand, um, um, I wanted to understand why the rest of the society wasn't jumping up and throwing away their crutches and saying, hallelujah, hey, we've got it. You know, yeah, your analysis is great, terrific, we're, we're with you. Um, so um, after I, I got my PhD in, in psychology, um, I was very fortunate to have um, convinced the National Institute of Mental Health to give me a research grant and began an organization called the Institute for Labor and Mental Health, um, uh, which we started in Oakland. And over the course of the next uh, 29 years, we developed a, um, a study of the psychodynamics of American society. And that study was, although NIMH <coughs> thought we were studying something slightly different than what we were studying, um, they, um, um, that study did um, uh, ask the following question. Why are people moving to the right politically? Why are they not responding to us? What is it in their life experience? And very quickly, um, we, were, uh, we came to, well, we listened to people's stories. The, for those of you who think in statistical terms, the N was 10,000. We had over 10,000 people. And this wasn't what we called drive-by sociology, where you put somebody, a questionnaire in front of somebody or a quick uh, telephone interview and then you think you know what's going on in their lives. What we found, it, uh, we ran groups that went from eight to 10 weeks with middle income working people. And, um, and in these groups, what people would say the first or second week was very, very different than what they would say the eighth or ninth week. Because um, uh, in, these, uh, in these groups, as trust developed, and then as new ideas um, uh, came into people's heads, they were able to talk about things that they would have never acknowledged to a sociologist or to an interviewer about themselves, things that they themselves were scared to think about in themselves, but eventually did come out in these groups. And um, so let me tell you what we learned. First of all, what we learned is that the ish when we asked people to tell about their lives, the first thing they went to was the world of work, and um, which is probably something that at least a fair number of you aren't that familiar with yet. But let me tell you, uh, tell you about the world of work, um, what they were telling us. Most people end up working in work situations in which the bottom line of the institutions within which they work is to maximize money and power. And the, um, 
And your value in the world of work is judged by how much you are successful in maximizing money and power. Now, this is not true for every workplace. It's only true for what the overwhelming majority of Americans face in their lives. But you could have grown up in a family and even in a neighborhood where you never even met anybody who is working in such a workplace. I don't know you. So it's totally possible since there are, there's a fair number of upper middle class jobs that are available to people where they do get a chance to, um, to use their intelligence, their creativity, where the bottom line isn't so explicit, where the workplace isn't so clearly and solely dedicated in that way. We also found out, by the way, people said, well, but I work in a nonprofit, and then it turned out the bottom line was to maximize the ego gratification of the people at the top. Um, but for most people, they don't work in nonprofits. They work in institutions in which the bottom line is that. But what I'm saying to you might not click for you if you've never been in this kind of a workplace. But what's important to understand is, is that while uh, there are many other kinds of workplaces, and you might be lucky enough, in fact, I'm sure that most of you will end up in places different than that, that the experience of day-to-day -day life for most Americans is going to a workplace in which the bottom line is to maximize money and power. And in that, uh, in that workplace, uh, your value is shaped by your ability to convince those who have power over you, your supervisor or their supervisor or their supervisor, that your contribution directly or indirectly, I mean, in other words, you could be a research scientist and you're not, you're not expected to immediately produce something that's worthwhile um, to, from the standpoint of maximizing money and power, but indirectly, that is, the whole institution within which you work judges whether your work unit or the whole sphere of, um, of research that you're doing is ultimately going to produce something that they can sell. And if, they d if it doesn't, and your unit isn't producing that even in the long run, they don't want you. So, um, so your, your value is in how much you can maximize money and power. And corresponding to that comes another, con uh, another recognition um, that people told us was central to their re daily reality, which is that the common sense of the work, world of work is Nobody is here to take care of me, to look after me. Um, everybody is here to maximize their own advantage, to look out for number one, as they put it. And that this is the common sense that people learn day in and day out. Looking out for number one is the fundamental reality of <coughs> the world of work in which the bottom line is maximizing money and power. And uh, as, as a consequence of that, um, that people are learning how to see each other, learning how to see each other primarily from the standpoint of what can you do for me? Can you be of use to me? How can your, whatever you're doing um, maximize my advantage? And this not because people never went to um, any, uh, you know, never had a consciousness raising. It's not because there's something wrong with the people. It's that the very structure of the work situation generates and regenerates and rewards this consciousness. Okay, everybody getting what I'm saying? Maybe it's obvious to you, right? At one level, it is obvious to everybody. Whenever I s speak about it, uh, at least for people who have been in the world of work, it's obvious, oh yeah, we knew that. But um, not quite in these words, but nevertheless, we knew this. So, um, <coughs> pardon me. So as a result, um, all day long, people are learning how to look out for number one and how to see other people in terms of, what can you do for me? How will you deliver for me? What can you give me? And then they bring that home uh, out of the world of work in the few waking hours that people have, the few waking hours that people have outside the world of work. Um, so, so that way of thinking can't be taken off sort of like dirty clothes, like when you were a, a miner and you were uh, working in a factory and you could take off, you could get one good shower and you were out of there. But there was uh, some sense at in previous, uh, the previous history of um, America where workers were in those kinds of situations where there was solidarity in the world of work. 
Today, it's quite the opposite. It's a, there's a sense of aloneness, everyone out for themselves. <coughs> and that then generates a consciousness that is brought home into personal life, where the number one complaint that people have when you talk to them about the society is, I feel alone. I don't know who I can trust. Everybody seems just out for money and power for themselves. They're just looking out for number one. And this is not a paranoid perception. This is actually a quite accurate perception of what everybody around them is doing. And so um, the common sense seems to be repeated. It's repeated not only in their interactions, but it's massively reinforced by television, in which almost every sitcom, in which almost every, every um, the sort of shared assumption of every movie is this that obviously people are looking out for themselves. And you don't even have to, you don't have to preach it. It's the motivation that is assumed to understand the characters in any of these movies or sitcoms, or at least the vast majority of sitcoms and, and movies, that people are looking out for themselves and trying to maximize their own advantage. In the, uh, in the sitcoms, it's who's going to have the best relationships, who's going to get the best dates, who's going to be whatever, um, who's going to be on top as opposed to on bottom in any in exchange between people. The assumption is that everybody is just out to maximize their own advantage. And that is so clear that by the time you're three, if you're getting what's happening in any of the cartoons that you've seen, um, where one is beating up the other or the, you know, the, the little animals and so forth, they all have the same personality structure as America. That is, they're, they're all looking out for themselves and maximizing their own advantage without regard to the consequences of the other. And, um, and it's all supposed to be very humorous and funny. But it is absorbed into the consciousness of children at a very, very early age that this is how it is in this world. So growing up in this society and then entering the world of work, one gets a massive dose of this conditioning. Understand that this conditioning isn't some content about some specific policy. It's not about you should be a Democrat or you should be a Republican, okay? You should be conservative or you should be liberal. It's pervasive through the consciousness of everyone. It's, it's, it, it's a much deeper level of conditioning and it shapes how people interact with each other and it has a dramatic consequence of making people feel very lonely. Um, if um, there aren't any people in the room who are old enough to be even thinking about this, but I can tell you that one part of our study ended up being around people who were um, in retirement age, and, um, and many of them uh, reported the decline in friendships. And what happens is, is that friendships increasingly become, uh, in this kind of a society, an exchange relationship. I give to you on the reasonable expectation that you'll give back to me an equal amount of whatever, time and energy and uh, caring or what. Now you might say, well, what's wrong with that? That's just an equal exchange, a nice little market relationship that works wonderfully. The problem is, is that as people get older, or even not older but sick, and they're not able to give back an equal amount of time and energy, they find that their friends seem to be disappearing. They're not there for I them as much. It's not that anybody who is not there for them is thinking, oh, I won't get a good return on my investment of time or energy here. It's just that the whole way, uh, the, con the, the basic consciousness that people have about what a friendship is, uh, an exchange relationship, just doesn't seem to be happening as much there. People report at that age that they remember, or at least they remember their parents telling them about, a time when friendships were based on, a, uh, on the principle of solidarity. Solidarity meant you're there for other people regardless of whether they can give you a reasonable return on your investment of time or energy with them. You're there for them simply because you care for them. But in a world in which what it is to be rational in this society is to maximize your own advantage, um, in that kind of a world, um, the being there for them decreases dramatically. And the amount of energy that one can give to that decreases dramatically. It seems almost irrational to be there for other people when you're not getting anything, uh, not going to be able to get as much back. 
This has tremendous impact in many, many areas of life. Let's talk about the dating world in which, um, um, now for the dating world and relationships, we want to transform the language slightly because here, when people are looking out for their own advantage, they, um, we, they translate it into the dominant, the, the, this dominant paradigm into the language of psychologies. And in, this, in psychologies, what uh, looking out for number one turns out to be is I'm looking uh, for a relationship that will satisfy my needs. And what I'm looking for is, um, uh, so I want to have my needs satisfied. Now, in the earlier years of dating, let's say for, for most people from the ages, someplace between 18 and 35, let's say, um, the, um, uh, the dating world actually does resemble fairly much like a big supermarket. Um, in which you go in and there are all these attractive, um, uh, attractively wrapped things on the supermarket shelf. And, um, and each competing for how they can be most attractively wrapped. And then you go and you taste one, and you might taste that for a night, or you might taste it for a month, or you might taste it for a year and a half, or three, or uh, as long as the ride is interesting. And then you, put, you can discard and go to the next and then to the next, and then to the next. So that what we learned from the younger people we were in interviewing, that is people roughly starting from about 27 on up, uh, just 27 to 35, is that by the time you've been in this dating world for eight, 10 years, almost everyone has a, uh, now I'm saying of the people we're studying, which is middle in income Americans, okay, has a deep, cynicism about who's out there. They've had a lot of experiences of either being used or using. Uh, using, I say, because we found that the younger women had, um, had um, um, an ideology around that they thought was feminist that said, look, I know that um, this is what it's about, and I'm not going to be some passive you know, passively used by others. I'll use my sexuality to use, <laughs> use others. I, I'm going to be just as strong and just as successful in manipulating others as others have been in the past, as men have been in manipulating women in the past. I can do the same thing. So, but anyway, by the time people are around that age, they've already had a decade worth of experience of being used and using others for the sake of having, a, having whatever is... Um, uh, maximizing my own advantage and having what, what will satisfy my needs and make me feel like I'm having a good, uh, a good experience here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not putting anybody down here. I'm not making any judgments. I'm merely describing how people, um, that the consequence of this is that people have a deep cynicism about who the others are that they're likely to meet in the society. They, um, and that cynicism, dramatically reinforced by the media and dramatically reinforced by their experiences day in and day out in the world of work in which everybody is looking out for number one, um, leads people to a point in which relationships increasingly, particularly when people get to the point where they're saying, oh, I've had enough of the marketplace of relationships, which isn't so easy because there's always more attractively wrapped products on the supermarket shelf. And, um, and why should you stop now when you, who knows what's in the next one? Um, but anyway, a lot of people do stop. At a, uh, and when they stop and are ready to make a commitment to somebody, commitments increasingly become based on the following kind of thinking. Among, I, I want to settle down now. I want to make a commitment. I'm going you know, to live with a person or I'm going to marry somebody or whatever. So I want to find um, the person who will satisfy my needs more than anyone else. And, um, and so um, uh, when I find such a person, I, um, my determination or my commitment to you is this. Um, amongst the people whom I imagine are likely to fall for me in the short run, because I'm no longer wanting to be in the marketplace forever, Amongst the people who are likely to, to fall for me in the short run, you will satisfy more of my needs than anybody else I'm likely to come across. So I'm committed. Now, you might say, first of all, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? 
well, let me tell you, there's nothing. I'm not making any judgment about this. I'm saying that this is how people experience what commitment becomes increasingly. So that, um, so that a marriage, so that a, a loving relationship is consciously or unconsciously um, generated by that sense of, yeah, amongst, I, I, you know, like the people who are going to likely to fall for me, you're the best one. You're going to satisfy more of my needs than anyone else I'm likely to meet. And I say, I'm not making any judgment about this, but the consequence of it is a dramatic upsurge of insecurity amongst most people in the society because they suspect, usually quite reasonably, that their partner, if their partner is equally rational to who they are and they think that they're probably just as smart and so forth, that their partner also is making that same calculation that amongst the people he or she is likely to meet in the short run, you satisfy more of their needs than anyone else they're likely who's likely to fall for them. Why does this generate insecurity? Well, it generates insecurity because <coughs> from that point on when you get this, um, or you suspect it, or you intuitively grasp it without ever putting it into words, um, you know that at any point your husband or wife, your partner, uh, might find at some point in their life someone else who would satisfy yet more of their needs than you can. And then, as a rational person in this society, where a rational person is a maximizer of self-interest, as a rational maximizer of self-interest, of course, they are going to try to cut a better deal. Uh, do you see what I'm saying here? They're going to try to cut a better deal because this is just what it is to be rational. It's to find the best possible way to satisfy your own needs. So why shouldn't I go to this other person if I have uh, some reasonable expectation that she or he will satisfy more of my needs? And this generates tremendous insecurity. Yeah. Okay. That, trust me that, okay. <laughs> what? Trust me that this, getting all of this is, is more <laughs> important than what we can do. Because if you understand the pain that's going on around you in the society, um, then you, have some, you start to get a feeling for why it is that liberal ideas don't quite get there. And that's, what, that's essentially what I'm trying to talk to here, is why the liberal or progressive agenda isn't deep enough yet. So let me, let, give me another few minutes on this, okay? <laughs> All right. So, um, so the way this plays out, it doesn't play out the same for everybody. It depends on your class position and many other factors because um, the basic issue about how insecure people are, and I say this transcends, but this insecurity goes through um, the whole society because uh, it's not just the 50% of marriages in America that end in divorce. It's also the 50% that don't end in divorce because most people don't know which of those two categories they're in. They don't know for sure that their relationships are going to last or not. And so the insecurity is very strong. But how much it affects you depends on your own assessment of your own marketability in the marketplace of relationships. If you are, um, to the extent that you are younger, more conventionally attractive, or more financially secure, these issues don't really weigh that much on you. Conversely, to the extent that you are older, or less conventionally attractive, or less financially secure, these issues become huge, huge issues of insecurity. So I the insecurity is stratified through the society depending on these factors in your, that shape your own consciousness about your own market potential marketability. And you may be feel at, um, very strong at, uh, in your 20s and 30s and, not, and think, anybody who worries about that, they're just a fool. Right? And then when you're uh, in your 50s or 60s, it's a whole different ballpark in which you may be, this may be obsessing about this because your potential marketability has shifted dramatically. Um, I don't expect people here to quite get this until it's ever happened to you. <laughs> what? You get it? Okay. But your, your marketability is strong, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Nevertheless, you, you know. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Okay, I mean, 
so um, now I am not here to you know to, to put anybody down or to make a moral condemnation of any of this. I'm trying to tell you that when people are thinking in these terms about other human beings, it's almost impossible to not think this way and grow up in this society. To, to think about other human beings through this framework is so deeply embedded in the mass culture and in the experience of living in capitalist society with its uh, with the generation of its generation in the world of work of the consciousness of looking out for one uh, number one and maximizing self interest as the only rational way to be. So I'm certainly not going to want to judge anybody for um, for this kind of consciousness. It seems like it's the only possible way to be. Now, it isn't the only possible way to be. There is another consciousness that we call a spiritual consciousness. A spiritual consciousness is a consciousness that looks at other human beings and sees her or sees him as fundamentally valuable, not just for what she or he can deliver for you, but because he or she is an embodiment of the sacred. Or if the word sacred or, or created in the image of God, or if all that, just generates in you resistance and say, ah, God, I don't believe in that, whatever, fine. Then use the terms that Martin Buber said of um, uh, that um, there's an I-thou relationship rather than an I-it relationship. Or if that still sounds too mystical to you, then go back to Immanuel Kant and his language of seeing other people as subjects and not as objects. However you want to language it, this is a very different consciousness than the dominant consciousness, and it's what we call a spiritual consciousness. And similarly, when looking at the physical world, a spiritual consciousness is one that doesn't simply say, um, gee, we're not, um, we're not using our resources in a totally rational way. Um, we can use these resources in a better way. It's one that looks at, it doesn't look at the physical world and say, I wonder if there's something I could sell here. Maybe I could turn this tree into something that would make money for me. Um, instead, it looks at the physical world from the standpoint of wonder at the grandeur of what is there. Um, that's a spiritual consciousness. Now, what we discovered was the following about people in this world, the world of work that I, uh, that I talked to uh, you about a moment ago. That when people spend all day long in the world of work in which they are focused primarily on uh, in a situation where they have to maximize money for those who have wealth and power, that they come home feeling very upset about this, even as they simultaneously believe it's impossible to change. And what they're upset about is that they want a framework of meaning for their life. They want to connect to something that has higher power, ha has higher vision that connects them to something they can believe in. And when we first started discovering this, we thought, oh, this is baloney. This can't possibly be true. Because everything that we had learned in academia or, and everything we had learned in the left or in the liberal and progressive world and in psychology was that we, the elites, have meaning needs, but they, the rest of the population, they only have material needs. And what we were discovering in our actual research was that this hunger for meaning and purpose was pervasive throughout the society and that uh, it was a tremendous crisis in people's lives that they had no opportunity to connect to meaning and purpose for their lives in their world of work. Now, on the so you have people coming home from work with this hunger for that and at the same time simultaneously a sense when you, we talked about it with people and their first response is, yeah, but there's nothing you can do about it. That's just what the real world is. That's how it is. There's just no way to change that. And then on the other hand, they have personal lives in which they feel they are never seen in the spiritual way that I talked to you about a second ago. They're, that a huge number of people report that they are never seen as being fundamentally valuable. They are always seen in what I'd call instrumental or um, uh, utilitarian terms. What, if, what can you do for me? Um, what have you, even husband and wife, um, 
uh, what or partners, uh, um, lovers, uh, always thinking in terms of, well, what are you doing for me? What, what's in it for me? How much am I getting back from you? Um, and even with children, what have you done for me lately, Dad? What have you done for me lately, Mom? And people who live have in the, are in this situation in which they neither have um, recognition um, for, uh, of, of the sort that I, I call a spiritual recognition, in which people can see you for who th you are, but instead are saying to us, nobody recognizes, nobody ever sees me. They only see me about what I can do for them, but never they, s they don't get me as a being. And I never get that experience of being perceived, or at least very, very rarely, if not never, very, very rarely do I ever feel anybody seeing me outside of the framework of how I can be of use. And that's your personal experience in life, your personal life. And then in the work world, you're doing work that has no meaning and purpose and other than to maximize money or power for somebody else. When these two things coincide, you get a spiritual crisis in American society, a deep spiritual crisis. And the terrible news for liberals and progressives and those of us who want to change this society is this, that the right, the political right, was the first group to recognize and articulate this. And just as the women's movement gained tremendous power when it was able to articulate the pain that women were feeling but it had no name, but it had no name until the feminist movement came along and said, oh, that's sexism, that's the results of patriarchy, that's the results of chauvinism. And e way before the women's movement was able to deliver significant change, just their ability to name it earned them tremendous respect and, uh, and commitment on the part of many, many women uh, who felt such a relief at understanding this. So the political right has done that for a very large number of people in the society. It has given them a language to understand that there is something deeply wrong in their lives. This, um, th and that language is the spiritual crisis the, and the excess of materialism and selfishness. Now, the terrible thing is that the right then goes on to blame the materialism and selfishness on the demeaned others of the society. And so this is a universal formula. Wherever you go in the world, when you find a right-wing movement, whether it be political or religious, that is successful, it's one that correctly articulates um, the spiritual deprivations that people are feeling on the one hand, and then unfairly blames whoever is the, the demeaned other of that society on the other hand. And, uh, and so in the, in, the in the 20th century, for the first half of the 20th century, that was Jews in Europe. Um, in, uh, it, today in Europe, it's increasingly uh, Muslims who are, who are the ones who get in this position. But if you go to Muslim societies, to some, some Muslim societies, well, it's the Kurds, or it's whoever is, you know, wherever you are, what, um, whoever is the historic demeaned other is the one that gets the blame. In the United States, of course, the primary demeaned others of, of our society have historically been uh, Native Americans and African Americans. But in the last 30 years, the, the right in its magnanimity has tried to extend this category to include in it feminists, um, gays and lesbians, um, and increasingly liberals and uh, liber all liberals and all, uh, and all secular people, actually, in the last few years. <coughs> now, the irony, of course, is that the right is the primary champion of the ethos of selfishness and materialism in the world of work. Because in the world of work, the right is always the, the force that is championing the right of every corporation to pursue its own self-interest without regard to the consequences for others and saying that we want less government to regulate, to restrain, or to demand any kind of social responsibility, right? So how do they get away with this? On the one hand, champion of let every corporation pursue their own self-interest. On the other hand, championing and articulating the pain that people have when having spent all day in a world of work in which they're learning selfishness and materialism, they bring that home into personal life. It's a huge contradiction. How do they get away with it? They get away with it because the liberal and progressive forces aren't even in the relevant ballpark. They don't understand that there's a spiritual crisis in the society. And very often, uh, because of the long history of the left having emerged in struggle with the, um, uh, having emerged in struggle with the um, feudalist uh, society several hundred years ago in which the central uh, underpinning of feudalism was religion uh, and uh, various beliefs in God, 
the left is filled with anger at God, and that transmits into anger at and putting down of people who are into religious or spiritual consciousness. So that then makes it easy for the right to become the champion of the spiritual issues. And um, now it's more complicated than this. I'm giving you a very sim simple part of this stuff, and I have uh, a much more sophisticated articulation of it uh, in, in this book that's just come out in paperback. It's called The Left Hand of God. It was in hardback last year, a national bestseller. And um, it tells the story in a lot more detail. I'm recognizing that I'm telling it in a very, um, say, vulgarized way in order to get it all out. And, but this then has led us to say, OK, if the left has been unable to recognize the spiritual crisis in the society, we need a spiritual progressive movement. And that's why I and uh, Cornell West and uh, Sister Joan Chittister started this new organization two years ago, ago called the Network of Spiritual Progressives, which came out of um, some of the work we have been doing in Tikkun Magazine, which is going around. And um, you can find us, uh, the Network of Spiritual Progressives, on the web at www spiritualprogressives.org, www.spiritualprogressives.org. Okay, um, what's the spiritual progressives about? Well, I'm not gonna talk about all parts because I do wanna get to questions and answers or whatever. So I'm just gonna tell you one part, which is the central thing. We want, our central demand is this. We want a new bottom line in American society. A new bottom line. It, in more technical terms, we, we'll put it this way. Today, institutions or social practices are judged efficient or rational or productive, both on the individual and collective level, to the extent that they maximize money and power. We are saying that institutions, whether that be corporations, whether that be, uh, whether that be um, uh, our legal system, our medical system, our healthcare system, our, I mean, our education system, Whatever the system is, um, whatever you're judging um, uh, about efficiency, productivity, rationality, that they should be judged that not only to the extent that they maximize money and power, but also to the extent that they maximize love and caring, kindness and generosity, ethical and ecological sensitivity, enhance our capacities to respond to other human beings as embodiments of the sacred, and enhance our capacity to respond to the universe with awe and wonder and radical amazement at the grandeur of, of all that is. So that's a very different bottom line. Oh, yeah, you want me to repeat it? <laughs> okay. That institutions should be judged rational, efficient, or productive, not only to the extent that they maximize money and power, but also to the extent that they maximize love and caring, kindness and generosity, ethical and ecological sensitivity, enhance our capacities to respond to other human beings as embodiments of the sacred, or however you want to language that, or see them as, as fundamentally valuable for who they are, and enhance our capacity to respond to the universe with awe and wonder and radical amazement at the grandeur of all that is. Okay, got it, you're saying? Okay, now if you think about this as a new bottom line, you'll quickly see that all of our institutions are irrational, inefficient, and unproductive. They don't tend to produce loving and caring people. They don't maximize people's capacities to, re, uh, to be ethically or ecologically sensitive um, or to respond to the universe with awe and wonder or any of that. Um, now you might say, but wait a second, are you saying that nobody is loving and caring in society? No, we're not saying that. We're saying that people are loving and caring and have these qualities despite the institutions in which they live, not because of them. And it's always a fight. People have to feel like they're idealistic to go for the, these values and that they're struggling for them rather than to be nurtured and supported in them. So we're, we're saying that a, um, a spiritual movement, a progressive spiritual movement, is one that is calling for a new bottom line, a fundamental rethinking of, uh, now of all aspects of the society based on this criterion, 
Does it produce more love and caring? Does it produce more generosity? Does it produce more ethical and ecological sensitivity? Does it produce enhance our capacity to respond to other human beings as, uh, as fundamentally valuable? Or to the universe as embodiment of uh, as something that uh, we respond to not just in a used way, but also just seeing it as ex inherently valuable? Does it do that? Now, this is a general principle, okay? So this is what we're about, new bottom line. But then you might say, oh, very nice, but how does that translate into anything real in politics? And so that's where we've developed uh, in the book and also uh, a shortened version of it on, online, the, um, <coughs> uh, the uh, spiritual covenant with America that has eight points about how you do this translated into healthcare and how you do it in relationship to families and how you do it in relationship to um, a whole variety of different issues. I'm gonna take one because it's the one that is most pressing at this historical moment and that some of you have already seen is translated here into an ethical way to end the war in Iraq and it's going around. Um, but it's this, in relationship to foreign policy, what's, what is a spiritual uh, approach to foreign policy? A spiritual approach to foreign policy says the following. Our new bottom line is love and caring, right? So our, um, so, <coughs> so, we start with the following, that in the 21st century, the only rational way to be in this planet is to recognize that our well-being as Americans depends on the well-being of every other person on the planet. We no longer will accept a president who gets up and says, God bless America, and doesn't simultaneously say, and every other nation and people on the planet, because it is fundamentally irrational to look at the world that way. But what's our strategy? How are we going to deal with the danger in the world? What's our strategy for homeland security? What should foreign policy be based on? Well, what we argue, and again, I'm saying it in very uh, vulgar ways here, but I say in the book it's laid out in a much more detailed and more sophisticated way. Um, we argue that for the last 5,000 years, human beings have, been, um, have bought into, the, or at least governments and uh, people with power have bought into the idea that our most effective way of providing homeland security is domination and control over the other. Uh, viewing the world from the standpoint of that the world is a fearful place and that other people are likely to take advantage of you and get power over you. Um, a consciousness which seems totally um, reconfirmed by our experience every day in this society, right? In which for all the reasons that I've, I took so, such a long time to lay out uh, before about why people would think that the world is like that when, why wouldn't they think that when their daily life experience is constantly based on that very same principle of everybody taking advantage of everybody else or maximizing their own advantage without regard to the consequences for others and in every sphere. Of course, that then seems just so obvious, so common sense, so to speak. Now, we're saying that strategy, the strategy of domination, has failed. And that the appropriate strategy for homeland security to protect the United States is a strategy of generosity. It's that we want to replace domination with generosity. And this is something you will not hear from any of the presidential candidates, no matter how enthusiastic you get about them. Because none of them are willing to challenge the fundamental assumptions on which it all rests. Even I might say Carter, even Carter, okay, what? Even Kucinich, okay, even Kucinich. They're not willing to get to the fundamentals. They'll talk about um, we should replace militarism with diplomacy, but diplomacy is simply a word for non-military ways to coerce the world into, our, uh, into following what's in our interests, not a uh, a paradigm shift in which what we say is we are part of this world as a totality in which it's not our interests anymore that are the determining factor. Or another way of putting this, which is I think more, more, um, uh, more accurate, is to say that the irony of the 21st century, ironic reality, is that these old spiritual values from 2,000 and 3,000 years ago are no longer just pure idealism, they are actually the nece practical necessity of the 21st century. That is, that our best interests are served by not 
focusing on our best interests. Can you get that? Okay. That our best interests are served by focusing on what the best interest of everyone. That we are going to be more secure if we are able to overcome the nationalist um, or a nationalism is only self looking out for number one writ large on, onto a whole society. It's that same consciousness that I've been talking about all through this presentation. It's we're first, our needs are first, and if other people get anything out of it, that's great, but really what we're about is get, you know, let me get what I can for myself. So, so okay, strategy of generosity as the core new notion of what a foreign policy should be about. Okay, not only, okay, uh, just because I'd like to step on anybody's feet, I can, okay. <laughs> not only nonviolence, okay, not only nonviolence, a whole fundamentally different paradigm of what politics should be about. Why should I be nonviolent if the next one is gonna screw me? You have to challenge the assumption that that world is like that, or that the world has to be like that, and it cannot be different in any fundamental way. And that's why we are working together, because Michael shares that spiritual consciousness as part of, uh, which leads him and me to being nonviolent. But the one last thing, and then I'll stop, because you'll see in the ad um, that what we then say as fundamental is, okay, let's translate that concretely. So we're calling for a global Marshall Plan, a global Marshall Plan to use between one and 2% of the gross domestic product of the United States each year, now I'm not talking about the budget, I'm talking about the gross domestic product of the United States, which is considerably larger than the budget. The GDP, um, one to 2% of the gross domestic product of the United States. Any water? Oh, I'm about to go. <coughs> Each year for the next 20 years to once and forever eliminate global poverty, homelessness, hunger, inadequate education, inadequate health care, and, um, and repair the global environment. That is our program, okay, for politics, okay? The global Marshall Plan. Global means we're part of the globe too, okay? So it's domestic and global. <coughs> and the global Marshall Plan is not, doesn't, uh, now, some refinements and then I'll stop. We're not talking about dumping money on countries that are, that are corrupt or that are gonna siphon all the money off to their dictators or so forth. We, if we're gonna do a global Marshall Plan, it's going to be done in a way <coughs> that is thought out in terms of how do you reach the best interests of the people in the society. Step number one is to involve them in the planning. It can't be us figuring out what's best for them. It has to be creating some international mechanisms through which uh, the people in that society, and not just their governments, actually participate in, yeah, what would be best. Number two, it has to be done in a way that is culturally sensitive. Number three, it has to be done in ways that are environmentally sensitive. Number four, it has to be done in a way which overcomes American arrogance. <clears throat> we don't want to approach this from the standpoint of saying, we know the best answers for your society <clears throat> because we're so successful, we're so rich, and so forth. We want to say, we're starting out from, and this is why you'll see in point number one of the ad, we start out from this. We are apologizing to the people of the world with all our money, with all our power, we have just dramatically screwed up and done something that is terribly immoral in the uh, war in Iraq. And we're starting with repentance and atonement. And our global Marshall Plan can also be understood as taking that uh, repentance and uh, um, atonement, not just as words, but as translating it into actions. But when we do that, we're saying to the peoples of the world, we want you to come and Bring your cultural speci specificity and your wisdom to our society because we know that we have deeply screwed up. So approaching the world with a spirit of humility, not of arrogance, is another central part of this global Marshall Plan. Okay, this is one example of what we're talking about with a new bottom line and a spiritual politics. Um, we have them in all the different spheres, um, but I'll stop here and say, um, only to say that um, we're trying to build a national movement. We've got about uh, 5,000 members and about 100 chapters around the country. We'd love to have you come and 
be an intern with us in the summer or an intern with us next year to help us build this reality. Um, it's not yet a, you know, it's going and it, it has some real energy behind it, uh, but we'd love to have some help, particularly in reaching out to younger, younger people where we have not yet found, figured out the way to, um, to do this because it turns out for whatever reason that you can explain to me that it's, uh, that it's been very hard not just in these terms, but in almost any of the movements around to reach deeply into the people under 40 in this society. That's another issue. But thank you, and I'm gonna go to. <laughs> yeah, She said that uh, she has a lot of friends who would, why don't we just give it to her? So I totally agree with everything that you've said. And I feel like I have a lot of friends who would agree with, with these policies and the idea, the, you know, just the ideas of the personal isolation in our society and the competitiveness. But you say the word spiritual and they're going to stop listening to you. And I don't know if you can change that. So um, what is the potential for collaborating with secular movements? Um, and have you heard of cosmopolitanism, which is the idea of um, every human being has equal moral value and there are policies to outline that. Um, and it's very, very similar to this, but the rhetoric is entirely secular. So do you see potential for collaboration with movements like that? Well, um, the first thing uh, I want to talk on two different levels. One is absolutely yes, we want to do we want to do that. Um, we would love to work with anybody who shares every other part of the pro program except <laughs> the word spiritual or God or religious or whatever. Fine, I'd be happy to have a a movement uh, that talked in these terms um, that was really about the same thing. But is it really about the same thing is very important because, um, um, for example, when looking at a question of um, how to value the planet, are they going to be looking at it not in reductionist materialist terms? If they are, if, if they're willing to go to a consciousness that sees the planet <coughs> as having some fundamental value apart from what it can do for us as human beings, if they're able to see other human beings in that way, then absolutely. And I'd be perfectly excited if you would organize that. You know, if you would, if you would, if you would create such a, a, a group here uh, on this campus or, uh, or amongst your friends if you're graduating or whatever. That's one level. Now the second level is um, we're also interested in actually winning in this society. And in this society, 80% of Americans say that they believe in God, and 60% um, say that they pray once a week, 60%. And for all the talk um, in liberals and progressives about their, their commitment to democracy and their belief that uh, if we're going to change this society, we need a democratic movement to do that, um, <coughs> they are not willing o overwhelmingly to recognize that this society has a lot of religious people in it. <coughs> Pardon. <coughs> Pardon me, I have a little problem here. Um, <coughs> so when they approach the world, the left has created a culture that pretty much reflects what you just said. <coughs> If you're religious or you're spiritual, I close my ears to you. I can't hear you. You're, um, you're obviously on some trip. And so, <coughs> and so what, was report, what we learned in our study was that a lot of people who would be with the left in terms of its economic and political programs have 
touch, have had an experience either in their unions or in going to an anti-war demonstration or in going to a women's movement meeting or uh, going to an ecology meeting or whatever where they picked up the following message. We need you. We need your support. We want you to be with us. We don't care if you're religious or you're not religious. But basically, we think you're on a lower level of intellectual or psychological development if you believe in God or if you have any religious or spiritual practice. We think that if you hang out with us long enough, you'll probably evolve to our level where you'll never, no longer think in God terms or spiritual terms. And that will be good for you. It'll really be good. So I hope you'll be with us. Now, for a lot of people who take seriously their own spiritual or religious life, um, the message is, I'm only welcome here as an inferior being, as somebody who is who they need at one level, but whom they uh, actually think is at a lower level than they are. And I don't feel good here. It doesn't make me feel like this could be my home. Now, do, what does that mean? Does that mean that I want you to become religious or spiritual? Not at all. I want you to overcome religiophobia. I want you to just as, and when I say this, most people on the left don't even know what I'm talking about. Just as most men had no clue about what sexism was when women started to raise that. They didn't know what the women were talking about. They couldn't figure it out. And all the more so, heteros could not figure out what gay people were talking about when they talked about uh, homophobia. It just seemed completely, what are you talking about? I like everybody. I value everybody. Um, in other words, you can't get this if you, unless you're one, <laughs> at first at least, until you are a victim of it, until, you have, until you're one of the people who has been treated that way. You don't get that it's happening, including in your own thinking. You don't recognize how much you put down and push away people with a different consciousness. A social movement that wants to win in this society cannot do that. So the question I have to many people on this level is, on the one hand, yes, I want to align. But on the other hand, I also want you to ask yourself, when building a larger social movement, would you rather hold on to your religiophobia or would you rather stop the war in Iraq? Would you rather end global capitalism or would you rather be in the position of being able to look down on spiritual and religious people who constitute the vast majority of people in this society and stick your tongue out at them and show them that you're so much smarter than they are and they're so irrational? Now, in the book, uh, I begin to also, and in the next book, I will also do this, try to explain to people why, besides all that, you're also wrong. <laughs> that, is, that is, on the substance, not that you're wrong about secularism, but that you're wrong about secularism being on a higher intellectual level. You still might be hearing this and saying, I, there's nothing I can do about it. I just do think that. And, and, what, I mean, and what I try to show in the book is why um, the view that I call scientism, that is the view that holds that that which is real is that which can be validated through sense datum or measured, and anything else that cannot be validated through sense datum or measured is um, is simply nonsense, okay, is a view that is actually the view of the, the capitalist class that struggled against feudalism, and it has no higher intellectual status than any other religious position. It is itself a religious position. That is to say that the view that that which is real or that which, uh, that which can be known um, is, valid, uh, is only that which can be validated through sense data or measured is a view that itself cannot be validated through sense datum and cannot be measured. <laughs> That's the short of it. I can make this argument more if you wanted to go into it. But whatever your view of rationality is, this is what's really rational and that's what's irrational, I'll show you that you have no more foundation for your belief system than the reli other religions have. Now, does that mean I want to put down your belief system? Not at all. I don't want... I am not here, and the network of spiritual progressives certainly is not committed to putting down other people because the truth of the matter is at least half of our people are secular people in this network of spiritual progressives. The only thing that makes them different from other progressives is they're committed uh, uh, to not putting other people down 
who are religious or spiritual and, th and, who, and, then, and to not have an attitude of, I turn off the second you talk about anything that's important to you around the world of spiritual or, or religious, but instead recognize that, yeah, I have my religion, you have yours, and both of them are, are uh, I'm able to tolerate both and, uh, and create space for both. Others want to go? Okay, so really briefly, earlier you talked about um, the rhetoric that the, the right wing um, uses, and I didn't quite understand whether they, they um, you said they championed the cause for, for either side, and I didn't understand whether they're bashing uh, the other side, blaming it, or whether they are championing, championing both sides, and so confusing, uh, you know. Well, yeah, they are championing capitalism, and they are uh, saying that what's bad is – the bad part of uh, capitalism is that it allows for this in extreme individualism in which women go for their own interests, gays go for their own interests, African Americans go for their own interests. They don't care about everybody else is what they're saying, that these groups are only looking out for number one. And so um, I should have gone into that more. I'm going to try to explain what women – yeah, it's true that women have been seeking to focus on advancing their own interests. But what they leave out of the picture is 10,000 years of patriarchy in which women's <laughs> interests have been systematically denied. They attack gays and lesbians. They why gays and lesbians? Well, because they're not uh, raising the next generation, which turns out not to be true in any society where uh, gays and lesbians aren't oppressed. But anyway, leave that aside. The point is that they say, well, you're just having sex for the fun of it, and it's not fair to the rest of us because we, we – <laughs> we we have to have the consequences. We raise children, and you don't, so you're selfish. So I say back to them, well, first of all, probably if you believe that God created you and so forth made and, and made uh, sex uh, pleasurable, maybe that wasn't a divine oops, but rather part of the plan <laughs> that it should be pleasurable. Uh, That's a wonderful <laughs> note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, Michael. Okay, good. Before you all go, if you – if you just say yeah. one, one last sentence, which is, if you want to contact me about an internship, it's Rabbi Lerner, R-A-B-B-I-L-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E Rabbi Lerner, at tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N dot org. And I'll, I'll email that. And if you, yeah, if you want to work with us in any way, um, <coughs> as you said, you want to write for tikkun, whatever, connect with me. Thank you. Before you all go, if you happen to have a minute, we're sending this poster to Iran, and we would like to sign it as a goodwill gesture from all of us. If you're going to take care of that. <laughs>